Peace, grace, and mercy be multiplied to you from God our Father and from our loving Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today's message is going to be about entomology. I'll explain as I go. I have met a lot of spiritual giants in my time, both before I was a pastor as well as afterward. Men and women who let the light of Jesus so shine before me that I could actually see Jesus in them, could hear the voice of Jesus as they spoke. People who made me feel real good because I was in the joy of their presence, but also very small, because if they could be so spiritual, then why couldn't I? Perhaps you've met some giants as well, some spiritual giants. Think for a moment. Maybe a mother or a father, a sister or a brother, a fellow church member, a factory worker, a neighbor, a pastor even. People who have really made you understand that they understood the gospel and they were living that life. But then I've also met a lot of little ants. These are the people who are all conceived about, well, consumed about little things. How does the one hymn put it? Many spend their life in fretting over trifles and in getting things that have no solid ground. How did Jesus put it? Martha, Martha, you are so worried about so many small things, but only one thing is needful. In our text, we see some ant-like behavior. Previously, Jesus had told the disciples, we're going up to Jerusalem. Okay, good. But there the Son of Man will be handed over to the Gentiles, will be shamefully treated, will be scourged, spit upon, and crucified. Now that they're at that place where these things are going to happen, what do they say? Oh, Master, look at the buildings, those beautiful stones, the way they're all put together. Have you ever seen such a sight before in your life? And Jesus said, well, do you think this is great? I'm going to tell you something. Not one stone will be left upon the other. They're all going to be thrown down. Beloved, over the years I've had a lot of antism, the small stuff, the insignificant thing. People place a high value on them and others don't even care, or maybe not even aware of it. Many times I've come across other Christians who say, you know, if you really are a Christian, then, and then they disqualify us. You will go to church on Saturday. Real Christians don't go on Sunday. You will speak in tongues. You will pray to Mother Mary. Your church will not have uh, musical instruments. You only sing from, the, from your heart. I could also say that you could call God Jehovah, you must, or that you have to believe in the teachings of Joseph Smith, but I said other Christians, and these are not Christians. Now, of course, there are other Christians who don't believe all that we believe, but they'll tell you the most important thing is the gospel. That's what unites us, not their secondary things. Some of you may remember, maybe you've experienced it. In the 80s, the blue hymnal came out. And for some people, if you didn't have it, you didn't have church. One woman actually told me, that's like changing to another religion. I, I, I have to have it or I won't go. Other people said the red hymnal or nothing. Well, now what has happened? Every church I've ever visited has the maroon hymnal or else bulletin services. So what about the red and the blue hymnals? They're like the stones. Not one of them is left anymore. We don't care about those anymore. But people made such a huge ant-like problem over them. We had a member here when I first came here. She hated the crucifix. She said, if I see it when I come in, I'm not coming back. So we walked the extra mile. We bent over backwards. We always showed the back side of the cross. I asked a fellow pastor about this one time. I said, what well, we got the, some of these people, they think the crucifix is Catholic, it's not Lutheran. He said, we preach Christ and Him crucified. Crucified means a crucifix, not an empty cross. 
And then there are so many other petty things that Satan uses to drive people away. You ask them, why did you quit coming? Well, this happened. Really? I mean, that stopped you from coming? Well, you see, it wasn't really, it was the principle of it. Beloved, the principle of Christianity is love and forgiveness. Over the years, from my first church to this present one, I've lost a lot of members over a lot of antism. In my first church, I lost a, a family because the woman's pie wasn't served in a week. It was the principle of it. In this church, I lost a young girl and her family because I was unable to shake her hand when she wanted me to. It's the principle of it. I have seen so many members point to the stones when Jesus was pointing to Calvary. I had a black congregation before I came here and one of our members quit coming. I said, what, what's the problem? Well, he said, the family, my family is prejudiced against me. I said, what do you mean you're all colored because I'm still old fashioned. I, yeah, but they're light skinned and they're against me because I'm black. We well, are all colored. That was reason enough for him to quit. And then I've had some Germans I've run across and say, oh, do you know so-and-so? Well, yeah, I, I know. Well, you have something in common. No, they're Bavarians and we're Prussians. But you're all Germans, aren't you? Not really. And so, it, doesn't, it does seem, however, that the apostles finally got the message. We read, and as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives by the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us when these things will happen. And what will be the signs about, the, about to be fulfilled? Their interest turned from the stones and the beautiful buildings to the second coming in the new kingdom. You know, a lot of times when we get involved in antism, we sometimes are stopped by the Holy Spirit and say, hey, that's not really important, is it? And then we turn to the important things. I want to give you some antisms. I love this church. I have many beautiful memories here. Not so much, Herb can tell you, when we were building. <laughs> but when it's all completed, it was well worth it. I've had some wonderful moments when people have joined this church, coming from others, and seeing a light. And I've had some sad moments when some of those people that I love so dearly got really sick and died. I enjoy the members of our congregation. I enjoy having visitors. And some of you I love and hold very dearly. Some of you I haven't gotten to know that well. I love our pastor. Even when he chooses hymns, I can't sing. <laughs> <laughs> or put so many verses in there, I lost my voice before I finished. <laughs> but I still love him. But all this other stuff is stones. Stone, beautiful buildings. It's not the one thing needful. Now, some of these things come and go, my first church. You will go there today and you'll see the steps, you'll see the two cedar trees, the building is gone. My other church was here on this hill, gone, got a new one that replaced it after I left. Buildings don't matter. Members, some of the people have, are still here. Some have moved back to be closer to their children. Some have joined the church triumphant. And some got involved in the stones and left us. But the one thing needful is the reason why Jesus led his disciples to Jerusalem for the last time. For it must be that the Son of Man will be handed over to the Gentiles, will be shamefully treated, will be scourged, spit upon, and crucified. But on the third day he will rise again, crucified for your sins and mine, crucified for the wages of sin is death, crucified 
and raise again to show us that the Father has accepted this sacrifice and to show us that Jesus really is who he says he is <coughs> and will always be. Who is he? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Not just the world generally, but your sins and mine. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.